This is a short story that happened to me several years ago when I was a junior in high school. All of my friends got to travel to Myrtle Beach with the baseball team for spring break, but since I didn't play baseball, I was stuck at home. My one friend, Dave, was home too since we were the skaters of the friend group. We spent most nights of the break hanging out together and not doing really much, except for one night when we stayed at Dave's house. He literally lives in the middle of the woods. The closest neighborhood isn't that far away, but because of where his house is located, it truly feels like the middle of nowhere. Toward the end of the break, we snuck out of the house to see a girl who lived near him. Since she and a few other girls from school were still in town, we figured that we would hang out with them. And like I said, it wasn't far, just sort of an unnerving walk because there aren't very many lights and most of the walk is in the seclusion of trees and rocks. We had an awesome time hanging out with them. I liked this girl at the time, so it was great to be able to spend so much time with her. When we were walking back to the house that night, Dave noticed some random guy following us, but I didn't think anything of it. He was freaked out, and I told him to relax. The guy was following us closely, but not close enough for us to actually panic. When we made it back to his house, I watched the guy continuing walking up the street, and he never seemed to look back. I just looked at my buddy and told him that he was freaking out for no reason. The next night, we hung out again and his parents were going out of town for the weekend, so he was going to have the house to himself. Since he was embarrassed by his house, he didn't want to have anyone over. Trust me when I say, I pushed hard for the girls to stay over, but I lost the argument. I told the girls that we couldn't hang out there, so instead, Dave and I walked to her house again. This time... We spent a considerable amount of time there. We didn't walk home until after about 3 in the morning. Dave was relieved on the way home that we didn't have anybody following us this time. I helped him close up the house and we got comfortable in the living room before passing out on the couches. At this point in the night, I was having one of the best nights of my life. I actually kissed the girl that I liked and I legitimately felt invincible. Not long after lying down, we heard a knock on the door and we both froze. What the hell was that? Dave exclaimed. Then the knock came again. It was a low and rhythmic knocking. Each bang on the wood made my hair stand up, and I slowly got up and, standing a few feet from the door, I shouted, Who is it? There was no response right away. And then a young female voice shouted from the other side, Hey, uh, I was wondering, can I please hide inside? I didn't say anything right away. The absurd nature of the statement and the calm tone of her voice left me speechless. Before I said anything, she spoke again. It's going to be too late if you don't let me in. Can I please hide inside your house? When I said that I was speechless, I mean I was absolutely at a loss for words. I had a million things flying through my head and I just didn't know what to do. My instincts told me that it was the girls playing a joke on us, but I didn't recognize that voice. I decided not to answer and neither did Dave, and we just sat in silence. And then I noticed the doorknob starting to jiggle back and forth, first slowly and then more aggressively. And then the calm voice instantly became more sinister when she said, Open the damn door now! I finally was able to shout, Go away! I'm going to call the police! There were no sounds for a few seconds. This woman spoke again. She started in a soft tone, and in the middle of the sentence, I could hear this sinister tone coming out, and she says, Hun, if you don't open the door right now, I'm going to lose my mind! Dave finally jumped up from the couch and shouted for her to go away and then a second voice could be heard from behind the door. It was a deep voice from a man, and he said, Good call, bud. Very, very good call. Right after he said that, I thought I could hear what sounded like footsteps walking away, so I looked out of the window and saw two people walking down the street. One of them looked suspiciously like the person from the previous night. It just seemed very similar in stature. We were terrified and stayed awake for the rest of the night. Since his parents weren't home, we 
didn't call the police, even though obviously we should have. Dave was scared that his parents would get mad if the police showed up and they weren't home. On Sunday morning when his parents came home, Dave told them what had happened and they instantly called the police, calling us stupid, which we were. Better late than never, I guess. And since several hours had passed since the woman had been at the door, the police were honest with Dave's parents and told them that they would probably never catch these two people, but that they would be on the lookout for similar incidents. I have no idea what those two wanted or who they even were. I don't even like being outside at night anymore. That night really messed me up for a long time and I'm still trying to recover from the mental nightmare I endured. I always had a really hard time focusing when it came to schoolwork. I've had some traumatic experiences in my life and as a result, it just makes me feel off. I can't focus at all when I'm home. Even when it's quiet, every little thing bothers me and I feel like I just read the same line a million times. In my sophomore year of college, I started driving to a secluded location and doing all my readings for school. I didn't live far from the country so it would only take me about 20 minutes to drive to a peaceful location. I found the peace and tranquility of nature to be soothing. I know it may sound crazy to some people that I would drive that far just to do homework, but I really had no choice. It ended up being the only way that I could concentrate on my work. When the end of my senior year was approaching, I started to freak out about one of my big exams. The exam was 40% of my final grade and I needed at least a 75 on the exam to pass the course. I decided that I was going to spend the weekend before the exam studying and that I was going to make my own little adventure out of the experience. Instead of going to my usual spot, I was going to travel to an area a few hours away, hike the beautiful trails and find a nice quiet spot to study. I left first thing Saturday morning and arrived at my destination at around 10 in the morning. I spent the early part of the day hiking until roughly 2 in the afternoon. I found this amazing spot near the top of a steep hill. It was a clearing that overlooked a bunch of trees. There were some rocks on top of the hill and I was able to get comfortable with my books and computer. I started reading my textbook and I thought that I could hear the sound of twigs snapping. Now in my distracted brain, all I could concentrate on was the sound of the twigs. It was driving me crazy. I first thought that there was some sort of deer or chipmunk or something that was prancing around in the woods. I thought that I could go over and maybe scare the animal and whatever it was would just flee further into the woods and away from me so I could focus. I made my way over to the edge of the tree line and shouted some nonsense noises to try to scare whatever it was, but I heard nothing. I made a sound again, clapped my hands together, and again I heard nothing. I stared intently through the thick trees and I swear that I saw a silhouette of a person move but I figured that my mind was playing tricks on me. I kept looking for a little while longer and I realized that the noise had stopped. I thought to myself that whatever I did must have worked. I sat back down and started to read my textbook again, but now I couldn't concentrate because I couldn't help the feeling that something wasn't right. I flipped through the pages several times and once I realized that I wasn't retaining anything, I decided to pack my things up and head back. I was fairly far away from where I parked anyway so I figured it was time to walk back and I would just find a spot to study that was closer to where I parked. When I walked over to the tree line, I paused instantly. Standing about 30 feet away, shrouded in the trees was the backside of somebody. It appeared to be a man since the shoulders were so broad but because the back was facing me I couldn't be sure. They were dressed in all black and it looked like they were wearing something on their face. I didn't move or say anything. I just stood there frozen and tried to calm down since I had a million thoughts flying through my head. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably only seconds later, and the person turned abruptly, facing me. And I can't accurately express how much fear I felt in this moment. The mask was horrifying. I would guess that it was homemade since I had never seen a mask like this in my life. It appeared to be white but also appeared to have a long snout hanging from the mask. It almost looked like a mask from one of those scenes in Beetlejuice if anyone knows what I'm talking about except 
Somehow this was creepier in the moment. As I said, the mask was white and not skin colored like in the movie. The eyes on the mask were jet black and wild hair protruded from the mask. I think the hair was attached to the mask and not the person because it was sort of a mustard yellow color. The person started to hum and I didn't notice it at first and I didn't realize that it wasn't some melody. It was a really drawn out hum, like a sort of groan coming from this person and they started to step closer to me. I freak out. The clearing that I was on was not big so in order to walk back to the trail I would have to walk by this person. I could have slid down the hill but I probably would have broken my computer and most likely broken my legs since it was extremely steep and very high up. This person started to run full speed at me still making that horrible groaning noise. I still can't even believe what happened next. The person ran at me, stops right in front of me. I'm frozen there. And they laugh. And then they just start humming again, but didn't actually lay a single finger on me. Not wanting to know what was happening or taking any chances, I just ran as fast as I could around them. The entire time that I was running, I could hear this person seemingly trying to follow close behind me, still humming but I didn't bother turning around. I finally made it to my car, and that person was no longer following me. I tried calling the police, but of course, my phone service was pretty shoddy out there, and I drove several miles to the closest town. I called the police once I got there and reported what had happened, and I don't think they did anything since technically the person didn't do anything other than just disturb me, and there were no other complaints. I have no idea what that freak was doing in the woods. I don't know if they were on something, playing some type of prank, or truly messed up enough to actually hurt someone. It seems unlikely that it was a prank since I didn't see anybody else in the woods, and it seemed like we were the only two humans in the area. I realize I shouldn't complain since I was unharmed in the incident, but the psychological trauma that I felt, it still sticks with me to this day. I'll never forget that terrible afternoon, and the memory of that horrible mask. I have spent the better part of my adult life as a painter. It can be tedious work, but it's paid me decent over the last 10 plus years. Being a painter has allowed me to open my own business, and to this day, it's been very successful. Over the years, I have painted all sorts of houses. New ones, old ones, and everything in between. I have painted some houses that look like heinous crimes have taken place there, but none of the houses have been more memorable than a house I was contracted to paint that was truly in the middle of Nowhereville, USA. About 40 minutes from where I live was this beautiful estate on many acres of land. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was big. The house was three stories and very old. The guy who bought the house was an investor of some kind from Florida, and wanted to buy a house in this area for some reason. I didn't care about any of that, since the guy was paying me well and a job is a job. My crew for this job was myself, my brother, and his wife. Since the house was so big, it was easily going to take several days to paint the entire interior of the house. The guy didn't live here, and the house was empty, so that made it easy. He was also putting in new floors in a couple of weeks, so I wasn't worried about covering the floors, which also made painting just a little bit easier. We started the job on Monday and was hoping to finish by the end of the week. Since nobody was at the house, I was even planning on staying a few late nights to get in some extra work. Monday was a little slow, but we put in some decent hours, and Tuesday we picked up some steam and got a lot of work done. My brother and his wife left at around 5.30pm and I decided to stay to finish up one of the rooms. Well, the few hours that I planned on staying turned into about five more hours, which was a major mistake. My back hurt so bad and I was feeling incredibly stiff. It was closing in on 11pm and I still needed to drive home, shower, eat and get ready to be back there at around 9 in the morning. I started cleaning myself up a little bit and getting myself organized for the next day before I left. While I was gathering some brushes and tape, I thought that I heard the sound of whispers coming from one of the other rooms. The house was objectively freaky. It was a giant mansion in the middle of nowhere with no furniture and looked like a recipe from a horror movie. I'm not going to lie, 
I half expected a ghost or something to jump out. After a quick and not very thorough investigation, I chalked up all the whispering sound to just my mind or the wind or something, house noises as they say. It was a big empty house after all, so having a draft and a creepy wind sound didn't seem impossible. And the next day came, and I was feeling sore from the night before, but I needed to get a good jump on the day. I told my brother and his wife about the creepy whispers, and they were actually pretty spooked out. She's all about ghosts and creepy things, so she was having a field day with this story. That evening, they decided to stay late with me and knock out a bunch more of the painting. I think my brother's wife just wanted to potentially hear the ghost, but either way, I was happy for the help. A little after nine, I heard a loud scream come from upstairs. It was my brother's wife. It sounded like one of those life or death type screams too. I remember having the thought, running upstairs, that she was probably playing some joke on us, but the scream sounded so real. When we finally made our way to the room at the end of the hall, she was lying in this fetal position on the ground by the window where she was painting. She had a stand-up light that had knocked over next to her and some of the paint spilled on the ground. At first, she seemed inconsolable. My brother was trying to ask her what was going on and she couldn't get any words out. I was freaked out more than I had ever been in my entire life and I didn't have any idea what was happening and I started to wonder if she actually did see a ghost, as unplausible as that may seem, but just based on a reaction. She finally started to speak, and with fear in her trembling voice, she said, I was painting around the windowsill. In the reflection of the window, I saw the closet door behind me start to open. I, I turned around, and two people ran out of the closet down the hall somewhere. And that was somehow scarier to me than anything I was thinking. The idea of ghosts is silly when you think about it. But the fact that two people were in the house, well that freaked me out more than some hypothetical apparition. We grabbed our phones and went to the car where we barely had any service, but we did have enough to call the police and the homeowner. Even though the house was out in the middle of nowhere, the police showed up pretty quickly and searched the home. We were horrified when they escorted three people out of the house. Two women and a man. The look in their eyes as they were being apprehended is still burned into my memory. These sort of dead but angry eyes, just staring daggers right through me. Apparently these people had been squatting there for months, even before the house was even purchased. They somehow had avoided being seen or found out during that time. It makes my skin crawl thinking that I was in the house alone with them and I had no idea. I don't think they intended on hurting us, but all three of them had knives and various other things on them and I'm happy I didn't have to find out. I'm not sure exactly what happened to them after they were arrested. All I know is that this job made me feel off from the very beginning and apparently my gut was correct. I'll never get the sound of her screaming out of my head and that's a sound that I hope I never have to hear ever again. I've always been someone who loved the outdoors, even as a kid growing up in a small city. My parents would have to yell my name from the porch to get me to come in at night, and I grew up when internet was still a relatively new thing and you had to use dial-up to get connected. Now some of you hearing this can probably hear the sound just by me mentioning dial-up. Anyway, the story I'm about to share takes place about 10 to 11 years ago. I was with my girlfriend at the time who I met in college. It was serious, but it was an on-again, off-again relationship. In all honesty, it was full of childish drama, and I was super immature at that point. We made plans to attend a local fair or carnival, whatever you want to call it, with some family and friends. We actually had a decent-sized group, so we decided that we would all drive separately, and that way we would have several cars and then everyone could leave whenever they wanted. I'm not usually a drinker, even back in my college years. Alcohol has always given me really bad anxiety the following day, so I usually just avoid it. For whatever reason, this particular night I was in a really good mood and actually felt like drinking. I was having a bunch of drinks with my girlfriend's dad. We were giving each other the old, hey, how long is it going to take you to finish that, or this is already my second one and you're on your first, 
that kind of thing. After, I don't know, a third or fourth drink, my girlfriend comes up in front of everyone and says something along the lines of, are you going to slow down? Or, I think you need to relax. And something like that, I honestly don't remember. I do remember acting very poorly and basically pouting because I was annoyed and embarrassed that she had said that. Again, I was super immature at the time. I remember then just completely shutting down, not being rude to anyone, but one word answers and being very antisocial. I remember my girlfriend even came up to me with a beer to apologize, which I declined and continued with the cold shoulder. Now looking back on it, I don't know why I was so mad and reacted that way. After walking around for another hour, I said that I was going to take off and head home. Since I didn't drive and had been drinking, my girlfriends asked how I was getting home. I said a friend was coming to get me, and I just walked off. I left the fair and walked to the parking lot. Now a ways back from the parking lot was a forest, and behind that I believe there are farms. It was still light out, so I figured that I would just walk into the woods and clear my mind and get out of that crappy mood that I seemed to be in. After heading into the woods for what I thought would be a quick walk, I started getting extremely hot. I don't know if it was because I was feeling buzzed from the drinks or because it was just actually getting hotter out, and the longer I sort of trampled around the woods, the more embarrassed I felt about my actions. I was realizing how childish I had acted. I figured that I would just head back to the fair, see if everyone was still there and meet back up with the group. But after walking for about 15 minutes, I realized that I didn't know where I was. I was lost. I couldn't find the path out of the parking lot. I stayed calm and tried to analyze my surroundings to see if anything would stick out. I started to move towards where I thought I had heard a sound, but realized that I really had no idea what I was doing and where I was going. I was stuck in the middle of the woods with no one around to help. I pulled out my phone and even though I had a bunch of text messages, my texts or calls just wouldn't go through and there didn't seem to be any service. After sitting on the dirt and thinking for several minutes, I thought the best idea was to just wait until nightfall. I didn't want to sink deeper into the woods not knowing where I was and I thought that I would be able to see the lights from the fair and make my way back. Then I would have cell service and I could call for a ride home. As the sun began to set and dusk started to set in, I became more uneasy. I noticed every little sound, a branch breaking, the wind shaking trees, but as it got darker and darker, I swore that I heard voices. I would twist my neck so fast thinking that I heard something. It sounded like the voices were getting closer and closer until silence. Everything was so quiet and then my heart jumped out of my chest as I heard someone yell, There you are! Get him! And I started running. I didn't know where I was going, but I just ran. I was bumping into trees, taking branches to the face. I tripped and fell, and on the second fall I decided to just stay still. I sat as quietly as I could, seeing if I got away from whoever was screaming and seemingly looking for me. And why were they looking for me? Was I just being paranoid? How did anyone know that I was even in the woods, sitting and waiting for dark? After a few minutes of silence, I heard footsteps going over leaves and branches. It sounded like people were talking to each other. The only thing I remember is hearing is, she expects us to get him, or something like that. And once I heard the voices start to trail off back in another direction, I began slowly walking. It had become very dark and I wasn't able to see any lights as of yet, but after what I assumed might have been five to ten minutes of walking, I started to see a glow in the distance, and as I moved closer, I could hear the murmur of life. As soon as I realized that it was the fair, and my way out, I just sprinted as fast as I could. I don't think I'd ever been that scared in my life, but I always look back on this experience wondering if there was anything to be scared about. Who were the people in the woods? Were they even looking for me or was it just some big prank or coincidence or maybe it was someone just being an idiot, I don't know. Whatever it was, now when I'm out hiking or in the woods, I always feel like I see something in my peripherals even though I know nothing's there. I always make sure that I'm back home by dark.
So the events of the story still make me think back to that night, and I'm still trying to process what exactly happened. The events that took place on this strange night were about 10 years ago from the moment I'm writing the story. My friends and I were 17 years old and spent most of our weekends with each other, a habit that started back in elementary school, playing video games and sleeping in each other's houses. All through middle school and high school, this was our weekend routine. At one point during senior year, we decided that we wanted to mix things up a little bit by taking a little night drive. It was myself, who had a license and a car at this point, and my two friends, Robbie and Scott. My parents trusted us because, all things considered, we were good kids. The night started out like most nights. Scott and Robbie showed up at the house to sleep over for the night. We ordered some pizza, played some games, and just talked about school for a little bit. Shortly after 11pm, we decided to go for a ride. For no other reason than to listen to some music and just exchange some good old-fashioned conversation. We just drove for a while, turning down roads that we didn't even know existed, and before we knew it, we had been driving for several hours, and I couldn't remember the last time we saw streetlights. It was extremely dark and desolate wherever we ended up driving. Around one, maybe a little bit later, we were driving down this really eerie and very poorly lit road, when we approached a car that was on the side of the road. But it was not just parked on the side of the road. It was kind of somewhat crooked, and the hood was tucked into the shrubs, almost as if though the car had lost control and got into an accident. The red tail lights were still giving off a soft glow on the road, and Robbie suggested that we look in case someone fell asleep at the wheel or something bad really happened. If someone had got into an accident, it would have taken hours for paramedics to find them if we didn't do something right now. We slowly and cautiously approached the vehicle. It was an older red Honda Civic. We got out of our car slowly and began approaching this red car. Robbie said in this really brave voice, Hey, anybody there? Are you hurt? And there was no response. And as we got closer, I shouted, Wait. While we were walking over, I started to make out some type of figures in the back seat just sitting up. And Robbie shouted again and this time with a bit of urgency in his voice. Hey, are you okay? Again, there was no response. No noise at all except for the motor of my car running several feet behind us. After a moment, Robbie finally said whatever and approached the red car, and we followed closely behind him, even though I felt something was wrong in my gut. We all were shaken with immediate fear as we went up to the window. There was, in fact... A person in the back seat, but almost more hauntingly, it was a mannequin, not a real person. And my first thought was, who in God's name would drive around with essentially a lifelike doll in the back seat? Admittedly, we got a good laugh out of this for a moment, but then the paranoia of this situation came back. Robbie continued to scream if anybody needed help or assistance, but there was still no response. And this is when I noticed that this mannequin had something in its plastic hands. It looked like some sort of tape, a VHS tape. Without thinking, I took the tape and I didn't even tell my friends until later that night. We decided to just call the police, which we should have done in the first place, and we reported this abandoned car. The police asked for the license plate number and that's when we noticed that there was no license plate on the car. Whoever ditched this car either didn't have plates or took those plates with them, and all they left behind was that creepy mannequin with that old VHS tape. So we made our statement and told the cops the location of the car and left. Later that night, while we were talking about this incident and just how crazy it was, and that's when I told my friends about that tape that I took from the car. In a sort of shock and perhaps a bit upset that I didn't mention it before, they of course wanted to watch it right away. On the sticker in front of the tape was this plain white sticker that only just said, Watch Me, written in black marker with very crudely drawn skull and bones. I had some pause, but decided that we had to watch it. Curiosity was getting the best out of all of us at this point, and I found my parents' old VHR in the crawl space and hooked it up to the TV. The tape began with about five seconds of a black screen and just the sound of a static tone. 
Then a man came on the screen with a beard and long hair. The quality of the tape was horrible. He stared into the camera, almost as if though he were staring right at us, and he wore a red flannel and sat at a table next to what appeared to be a workbench of some kind. He stared into the lens for two minutes straight without saying a single word. We watched the time and it was the most unsettling two minutes of my entire life. And after those two minutes, he laughed and then sort of morphed that laugh into a cry, all while staring directly into the lens, and finally said in this sort of low, monotone voice, This tape belongs to me, and I know you have it. I'll find it again, and you'll be sorry. He then followed this with another horrible laugh and cry combo. We then fast forwarded the tape for several minutes and nothing else was said other than a few laughs and just this strange man staring at the camera. And finally it just cut to black and it ended. Now after a bit of conversation about this situation, being stupid kids we decided not to give the tape to the police. I just kept it. And after all these years the tape still sits in my bookcase. I'll never watch it again and I've never even really spoke about this event until now writing it down. And I'm sure this is just some kind of stupid joke, but to us kids, this was burned into our brains for years, and I'm still kind of scarred by the mental images that I witnessed that night. Every time I see a man that resembles that man from the tape, even after all these years, I still get that pit of the stomach type feeling, and I'm reminded of that fear and paranoia that I felt in that evening. Why did he have a mannequin in his back seat? Why did he crash his car? And why did he have a tape there? Almost exactly a year ago, I had one of the worst experiences of my entire life. My friend Shane decided to have a cookout since a lot of our friends had just graduated from college and were home for the summer. The afternoon started exactly how you would expect a summer cookout to go. We grilled some burgers, drank some beers, and enjoyed a beautiful summer day. One of the great things about Shane's place was that it was seemingly in the middle of nowhere and located right on the lake. If you knew Shane, you would understand just how out of character this was for him. Shane was very much a city man. He grew up in the city, spent all of his time in the city, and even went to college in the city. Being outside, fishing and boating are things that I never thought that I would associate with Shane, but here we are. He ended up getting a great job after college, received a massive sign-on bonus, and he works from home 90% of the time. He spent the majority of that bonus on a boat, even though he had never driven a boat in his life. The afternoon of the cookout, everybody was begging Shane to take the boat out, and he was refusing. I think the main reason he refused was that a lot of people were at the house, and he didn't want to leave them unattended, but honestly, I don't think that he knew how to operate the boat and that's why he didn't want to take it out. As the afternoon progressed and people started leaving and eventually there were only seven of us left, the girl he liked at the time started to beg him again to take the boat out and before he knew it, all of us were chanting and begging him to take it out as well and finally, he gave in to the pressure. I knew right away that this was a bad idea. He was struggling badly to get the boat untied from the dock, and once we were untied, it was like a 15 minute struggle to get moving into the lake. It was clear to me that Shane most likely had never done this before, at least on his own. It was around 5 in the afternoon at this point, so it was still light outside, and we probably had a good 3 hours of light. I figured that we would take the boat around the lake a little bit, not move too far from shore, and be back before it got dark outside. Well, it was apparent that not everyone on the boat shared my concern. Everyone except me was pushing Shane to go further. Turn down this channel, go over here, etc. And before we knew it, we had traveled far from Shane's house. It was starting to get dark out and I could tell that Shane was nervous. I asked if he knew where we were and he just shrugged quietly. Around 8.30 it was nearly dark out and everyone on the boat was getting cranky. And now tempers started to rise because Shane had no clue where we were and he had no idea how to get back. Shane started yelling at everyone, telling us it was our fault for making him take the boat. He was half right of course, but some of the blame is on him also since he gave in to the pressure. Around 9, not only were we just drifting on a pitch black lake, 
but it also started to rain lightly, which caused the temperature to drop quite a bit. We all huddled up under the little canopy on his boat, and I said that I was going to call the authorities and they would send someone out to help us. Well, Shane didn't like this idea one bit. Basically, he said that we can't call, and this is when he finally admitted to us that he didn't have a license to drive the boat and the boat wasn't insured either. So if the police came out, that he would be getting a nice number of fines. And so instead of getting help, we just kept drifting. And at this point, nothing was scary. It was just annoying. I mean, sure, the darkness of night on the water is eerie, but being cold, wet, and angry trumped any feelings of fear that I may have had. At nearly 10 o'clock, Shane exclaimed that he knew where we were and he would get us back. He said that we were almost at his place. A few minutes passed and we started making our way close to the shore, and just as we were preparing to dock, Shane said in a sort of depressed voice, Oh no. I looked up and realized the reason why he said that was because there was no dock to be found, and no houses in sight. Wherever we were, this was not where Shane lived. Finally, I had the genius idea to check the GPS. I don't know why it didn't dawn on me until now, but I blame it on the drinking and the fact that I've never actually been on boats or used GPS on a boat. It took a second to find service, but when I finally did, I realized the nightmare situation that we were in. Not only were we nowhere near Shane's house, but we were also truly out in the middle of nowhere. The shoreline next to us was nothing more than a small little island, and the next closest shoreline seemed very far off. After some panicking and yelling, of course, we all calmed down and agreed to work together to get back to the mainland. The idea was that once we got to shore, we could just use the GPS map to follow the shore all the way back to Shane's place. It took a little while, but we eventually got to the shore and started slowly making our way back. About ten minutes into the trip, we saw a light coming right at us on the horizon of the lake. It was another boat. We figured that we could ask them for help and just make sure that we were on the right track. Shane got the other boat's attention, and that guy was creepy. He was an older man, rough looking, and I could smell the fish from where I was sitting. This guy was clearly some type of fisherman, and he said we weren't far off and that he would guide us back so we don't get lost. We were relieved, and we started following the fisherman. I started to question him a little since the GPS said that we were going in the opposite direction now, but Shane said not to worry and to trust the fisherman since he probably knows shortcuts or something. At around 11.30, the fisherman docked his boat on this rickety dock somewhere, and he asked us how our fuel was, and Shane admitted that he was nearly out. The fisherman said that he would fill us up, but he needed help getting the fuel since he hurt his back and couldn't lift the containers. So me, Shane, and the other two guys got out and started walking with the fishermen. The girls stayed in the boat and they seemed kind of freaked out, which I couldn't blame them. Something wasn't really right about this. I didn't know anything about boats, so I didn't know if this was proper boat etiquette or if this was one big red flag. We walked about a hundred feet from the boat and there was a small shack, but no house with it. In fact, there was nothing in the area except trees in the shack. The man said the containers were just inside the door, but the door was heavy. He asked if one of us could get the door. Shane started to open the door, and when he opened it, there was nothing inside. We turned around, and the man was running towards Shane's boat. Without saying anything to the girls, he jumped into Shane's boat and turned it on. We could hear these girls screaming and feared the worst. Thankfully, he didn't get very far. Shane and I dove into the water and swam to the side of the boat as the man was beginning to leave. Shane slipped getting into the boat, which alerted the man to our presence, and once he saw us, he dove into the water and just swam to shore. We lost him in the darkness seconds later, and we picked up our two friends on the rickety dock and I just called the police. With the little service that I had, I didn't care what Shane said anymore. Thank Christ, they eventually showed up, and we realized that we were about an hour away from Shane's house. Believe it or not, they actually found this guy's fisherman boat, but I learned quickly that apparently this boat had been stolen. Shane got into trouble for not having his boat legals and still gave me crap for calling the police to this day, even though some deranged man almost stole his boat with our friends in it. 
I don't really talk to Shane anymore since that night since he blames me for everything that happened. And as far as I know, they've never caught this random dude, so I have no idea what his plan was. All I know is that this was one of the worst nights of my life, and it could have been a whole lot worse if we hadn't caught him before he left the dock. Let the story I'm about to tell you be a lesson for you. Choose your friends carefully, because sometimes the people you think are your friends are the very monsters we're afraid of. I know that sounds kind of cliche, but honestly it's true. This is an absolutely crazy story and I'm still in awe of how certain individuals can act. A little more than a year ago I moved to a new town. I'm a city girl but was happy to start a new life in this town. I don't want to say that this is a country town, but it's a fraction of the size of the place where I grew up. I spent the first few months just keeping to myself and learning the day-to-day -day operation and how it works at my new job. On weekends, I would just sort of listen and see what everyone was up to. A couple of weeks into the job, I finally got invited out by one of the girls I worked with. I'll be honest, this was a lot like high school. This was the girl that I wanted to hang out with. She was the popular girl at our job and all the guys liked her and the girls wanted to hang out with her. Yes, we were adults and this mindset still applies. We went to some local bar that Friday night after work. I wasn't drinking much since I didn't want to make a fool of myself with my potential new friends. It didn't take long for me to realize exactly the kind of person she was. For the purpose of the story, I'll refer to her as Marissa. She was getting that wild level of intoxicated and it was uncomfortable. I laughed along and just hoped the night would end soon. I made sure all the girls got an Uber home and I finally headed off myself at around 2 in the morning. I was exhausted that night and clearly underestimated these girls. When I woke up in the morning, I had forgotten about a lot of the nonsense from the night before and just remembered the good times. I was happy to have friends and not be alone and that thought alone blinded me from the reality of who Marissa really was. The next night, we all hung out again, and the night was a copy of the previous nights. Nothing noteworthy other than Marissa being out of control again. That week at work, all week long, Marissa was constantly saying how she couldn't wait to get out again this weekend and that she loved hanging out with me. I was actually flattered and was ready to do it again this upcoming Friday. Friday came, and this time she was beyond intoxicated. She had become mean, even to her friends and the other girls we work with. They all left and, in so many words, basically said, forget this chick. I was paraphrasing there since I don't want to write what the girls actually said, and before I knew it, it was just me and Marissa at the bar and she was barely coherent. I got her home and stayed on her couch to make sure that she was alright. When I woke up in the morning, she was already awake and cleaning her kitchen. She thanked me for the previous night and invited me to a party later in the evening. I knew I didn't have plans, so I of course accepted the invitation. She told me to pick her up at around 10 that night and that she would direct me to the party. She had me excited about the party before we even left the house, and she told me it was going to be an epic party at her friend's barn. Massive bonfire, some food, drinks, dancing, and much better company than we would have at a local bar. I was so excited that I was basically singing in the car. Well, that excitement started to dwindle when I realized how long we'd be driving. It was after 11 and we still weren't there. If I knew I was going to have to drive an hour to some party, I would have declined, but Marissa was pumped and I really wanted her to like me. She finally had me pull over and sketchy is the only word I can think of to describe this situation. There was nothing in sight at all. No street lights, no signs, no houses, and most notably, no party. I asked her what was going on and she says, you're going to love this. It was so dark when we pulled up I didn't even realize that there was a small barn on the side of the road. I could see the beam from a small flashlight shining through the doors. Marissa told me that the party was over there and we needed to hurry up, which made no sense. Why would we need to hurry up? While we were briskly walking over towards this barn... I noticed that Marissa was wearing jeans and the person who was waving the flashlight seemed to be dressed in all black. Yet here I am, wearing some cute dress and I got full makeup on. When I was almost at the barn door I noticed that Marissa seemed to have fallen back. 
She was walking about a foot behind me for some reason. The guy with the light opened the door and inside I still can't believe what I saw. It was one of Marissa's friends from the bar, the one that said not so nice things to her. She was sitting unconscious in a chair. I immediately freaked out and demanded to know what was going on and Marissa replies, she disrespected me and now she's paying for it. I was stunned by the completely unhinged nature of her. I knew at this point that she was a wild party girl but I didn't think that she was capable of whatever this was. I didn't want to know why I was there and I didn't give her their option to tell me. Thinking as quickly as I could, I just kicked some dirt in the guy's face who was holding the light and I just grabbed the unconscious girl. I wasn't worried about Marissa stopping me because I was nearly double her size. I hoisted her up, running to my car and basically threw the girl in my back seat and sped off. While I was driving, I was fortunate enough to get some service and even though like I said there was nothing anywhere close to us, I was able to call the police and told them that I had an unconscious woman in my back seat. I told them about Marissa and that she was with a guy. Thankfully. Not long into the drive, the girl started to move and groan, and then she started to talk. I pulled over and explained what had happened, and she started crying. She said that the guy was some guy that she had been seeing for a little bit, and he was taking her to a party at a barn. When she got there, Marissa was there and hit her with some sort of heavy object across the face, and whatever it was knocked her out for a while. We finally linked up with the cops, and Marissa's former friend was taken to the hospital and treated for a minor concussion, and thankfully that was all. Later that evening, they found Marissa at her house, and she was completely surprised as to why she was getting arrested. She claimed to have had done nothing wrong, and the events that just transpired were just a prank. They never did catch the guy, and since he had been using a fake name and a fake cell phone number, and Marissa refused to turn him in. From what I understand, she still claims that this was just some sort of prank, and now she's locked up under false pretenses, under her word. I can't remember exactly what they did charge her with, but I know she got in trouble for assaulting her with a weapon and kidnapping, so obviously her future doesn't look too bright. This is truly insane to be a part of, and I hope at least one person can learn from my mistakes. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, Grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, Grimace is my grandmaster. <laughs>